brought to you by CNBC Africa and Safaricom Business. Great partners inspire great visions. Hello and welcome to the CNBC Africa World Economic Forum special coming to you from Johannesburg, South Africa. Now in less than a month, the global leaders will be convening in Abuja, Nigeria for the 24th edition of the World Economic Forum on Africa. In the lead up to Abuja, we've hosted a series of regional debates aimed at unpacking opportunities and challenges within East, West and Southern Africa. In Nairobi, we spoke about connecting East Africa through regional integration. We then moved west to Lagos, where we unpacked sustainable growth in a future beyond oil and gas. And finally today, we look at Southern Africa, more specifically, the role of education in empowering the region. Now, in a region where 70% of the population is under the age of 14, are educational institutions and policies well geared towards creating an educated and empowered generation? Our four studio experts and I will be debating issues around education, including its role in improving quality of life, eradicating poverty and reducing inequality. Joining me on the desk, John Foster Pedley, the Dean and Director of Henley Business School Africa, James Wanjohi, the Regional Director, James Education Solutions. Dr. Nkosana Moyo, the Founder and Executive Chair of the Mandela Institute for Development Studies. And Boy Pelo in Karimeng, who's the Enterprise Development Manager, SAB Miller. A warm welcome also to our live audience. Well, let's start with the first question. And I think, uh, Dr. Nkosana, I'm going to throw this to you. Is education necessary for employment? Education is necessary for employment, but I don't think it should be geared to employment only. I think we need entrepreneurs, and those should be people who understand the world around them, technology around them, how to manage people. So education should be much more, for me anyway, a disciplining of the mind as opposed to technical training. There are some trades where it's technical training, but education generally should be a disciplining of the mind. John, let's get your take. Well, I'm going to pick up on that, if I may, because I completely um, agree with uh, Dr. Nkosana there. Um, it should be an education of mind, but where I would differ slightly is that I think we need strong education of mind to do well in the workforce. And I think it's not just about trade skills and trade knowledge. We need to be able to think critically, solve problems, be imaginative, and apply things. And I think there's a lot of discipline and education of mind implied in that. James, I'm going to bring you here. complete agreement. Oh, good. <laughs> a complete good agreement. Yeah. An interesting part to, to kick off the, the yeah. panel discussion. James, I'm going to bring you in here, and I'm going to change my, my line of questioning. Perhaps we get an update on the state of education. You were involved in education across the board, from primary through up uh, just below tertiary education, through, through secondary education. The state of education as you see it in, in Southern Africa. Um, I, I think critical and most important is the first question is relevance. Are we educating our people with an end game of them being employable or being employers? I think as it is in most Southern African countries and also the rest of the continent, we're still teaching in curriculums that are pretty outdated. The use of technology as an enabler, and as an enabler has been sort of outdated. We're not m using a lot of, you know, technologies today to deliver education, especially at the basic and lower levels of education. Uh, I think the third one is also the element of the teaching profession. Are we encouraging teachers, the best people to get into the teaching profession to deliver the best results? As you know, you know, you put in bad content in, you expect bad content out. I don't know if the word rubbish, but you know, th the reality is we need to bring in the best quality teachers to get the best output for our students. The third part, I think, is the relevance of technical education, you know, vocational education. In our current state of education around Southern Africa, the emphasis is all on academic qualifications and very little vocational education and almost nil on entrepreneurship education, speci especially at the lower level of so education. So perhaps let me ask you this, are you not satisfied with the state of education in Southern Africa, considering no. it doesn't skew to the entrepreneurial side of things? It as is wanting out. because education needs to respond to the world's needs. And it's not doing that. Boy Pille, let's bring you in as well. And I also think, I mean, from a private sector point of view, our experience has been that the new people that come in or the new entrants into work do need help 
uh, in terms of learnerships and getting them up to speed. And that speaks to the level of education that we have and whether we're producing people that are ready to actually enter into the workplace. And the quick question, the quick answer would be no, we're not. So there's something that's not happening in the education system that needs to be corrected. A and also that brings me back to within the enterprise development space where we're trying to look out for entrepreneurs and, and mold them, are schools really preparing people to think, like James said, as entrepreneurs as opposed to thinking to get a job? Because the reality is right now, not everybody can be as absorbed into the formal employment and what do we do? So what are we doing right? Let's, yeah. let's break this up into <coughs> primary, secondary and tertiary. Are we ticking any of the boxes? when we talk about those three tiers. Gosana? Well, if, if the foundations are not in place, it's very difficult for any of the following stages to actually tick any box. So are the foundations solid? I think the evidence suggests that they're not. Because I think when you listen to what's coming out, when you listen to people at universities, the way they struggle with people who come to university unprepared and then spend all their time actually doing remedial teaching, it means the time allocated by the time those students come out of university, those who do come out, they've actually lost something in terms of the time they should have spent studying at university level. So I think the foundations absolutely need to be fixed. John, let's get you to weigh in here. What do you think is coming out of the primary tier of education in Southern Africa specifically? I, th I think it's a very mixed bag. I mean, you've got schools that are really struggling and you've got schools that are trying to innovate. What's missing is a consistency and, and an understanding of how you apply resources into education because it isn't just about having a good syllabus or good re resources. It's much more about resourcefulness, imagination. and. Education, the altruism, it's not about filling people up, it's about setting them on fire in a good way, mm. you know, and giving them a passion for learning. And I think that's what's missing. You don't need brilliant research to do good education, but you do need brilliant teaching. And I think we've really got to emphasize the quality of our teachers and encourage people into that, that whole system. So it sounds like as though we are headed to a necessary shake-up of the education system in Southern Africa. Yeah, the, the big... The big uh, input at the foundation stage is normally maths, maths literacy and English. And I, uh, evidence shows that especially in a country like South Africa, that has been failing. And that actually affects you all through your higher school and university. If you don't have the right literacy and you, don't, you can't speak proper English, you will fail in life. Now, in, in the context of South Africa, with that cog uh, cognizance, there's been some input from the private sector trying to sort of help resolve the education challenge in the, in the mainstream. And that's through where they, they've set up what they call the National Education Collaboration Trust that is really helping try to turn around a situation of failure. Where, you know, we're having a 30% pass rate at matric. You know, that's appalling. That's I not far from other countries. I would like to disagree. Tanzania and others. See, I, I, I knew the disagreement yeah, yeah, yeah. was coming. <laughs> I was counting I, on it. I think, he, I mean, I understand mathematics. I don't agree with lumping English into mathematics. Yeah. And part of the challenge we have in, in, in Africa generally, not just Southern Africa, is to try and decide what are the foundations of education. Mm. I think we, we get our kids mm. into a very alien environment way too early. We don't try to get them grasp the principles of education but using their own natural environment. So we put them at a disadvantage, in fact, when we, we throw everything at them, including the language of instruction, very el too early in, in their education stages. I think we completely disadvantage them. My view would be that kids in the early stages ought not to be disadvantaged from a language perspective, that they, they should be grasping elements about the nature around them with as much familiarity as possible. And they learn English as one other subject as opposed to with the language of instruction too early. And that way I think they will be much more comfortable with the concepts that you're teaching them because you're not introducing everything as alien to them too, too early. Wapelo, the private sector SAB Miller's Kickstart program is gaining traction and you are certainly seeing a good turnout in, in terms of uh, the, the training that you are embarking on. Perhaps just going to what James was saying earlier, you can elaborate on how the private sector is pooling together to change the status quo when it comes to education. Well, I, I mean, for, for us, why we specifically included education or training was we saw that there was a gap. There's a lot of um, 
entrepreneurs that come in that have the technical trade but don't know how to run businesses or how to manage their businesses. So that was very critical for us to ensure that that part is also managed. Because when you run your business or starting your own business, nobody thinks about that transition from being um, a worker to somebody who's actually employing people. And so that's how the training came about. We partnered up with, with uh, one of the business schools I shall not mention at this point um, <laughs> that They're are helping good. us, <laughs> 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 that have that ha that are assisting us with 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 this program, and it's been phenomenal. I mean, the kind of responses we also get from the entrepreneurs that, you know, I'm looking at my business differently, and I've never thought of my business in this way, and it it. You know, when you know what to expect in a business, you're better placed to manage it. And that's what I think training and education provides you. Somebody tells you that this has been done before and this is what it looks like. It gives you some sense of comfort in, in your we journey. We are identifying the gaps in, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, those different tiers, primary, secondary, uh, and tertiary. I want to come back to the challenges that we're facing to revamp the system. If we, if we want to achieve a certain status quo, what is it that we need to do? Is it funding that is required? Well, I think Nkastana raised a very interesting point there. He, he raising the issue of, of, of learning in your own language to begin with in a context that works. And let's open that idea up, because why not? You know, what are the prejudices and the assumptions we have about education? It's got to mirror some sort of Western model of education. It's not got to do that. We confuse education with intelligence all the time, I think, particularly in South Africa, particularly with our history. We're actually blessed with extraordinarily intelligent people in South Africa. But the other thing is, are we creating education so that people do jobs or create jobs? And so if we're creating education that people are going to create jobs, we've got to think about what is it we need to in, in get them going with, you know, how do we get them thinking about opportunity, taking initiative, seeing possibilities, building business acumen and other forms of acumen. Because education should be not only about building up knowledge and academic freedom, but it should be about creating better value and better lives. Therefore, we need to engage with that. Now, SAB is a great example of a company that's done that for years. They've had a set of programs, both through Kickstart and other initiatives, where they've been feeding back into their suppliers and educating them and, and starting small businesses. It's not about going to government only. It's about all of us getting involved in whatever way we can about this mission of improving our quality of life through education. I still want to, to focus on the challenges that yeah. we are facing to changing mm. the status quo mm. as it exists today, because we, we're talking about the challenges. If we want to change the, the curriculum, what do we need to do? Yeah. Is, it, is it regulatory? Well, let, let's get back to what James said, because I think it's a key component. A lot of people tend to think that edu good education comes from throwing money at it. I don't believe that is the case. But I think where he's absolutely spot on, what kind of teachers do you have? How committed, how enthusiastic ab are they about their subject? Do they make it fun to learn? Now, what, what puzzles me in taking this country as an example is that when, if you say, I want to go to a hospital and I'm a patient, I actually am quite concerned about who is sitting on the other side as my doctor. Yeah? So you're talking about the quality of the teacher? The quality of the professional who is attending to this, whatever it is. So if in a nation your best resource is people, your best resource is people, you would have thought that you would put all of the effort necessary into making sure that the people are given the responsibility to do that preparation of that human resource are absolutely capable and qualified. Now, what else goes with that is that in all the other careers, we understand that people get put through training, they are examined regularly to make sure that they stay competent. One of the things I, I cannot understand for the life of me is how in this country, for instance, the politicization of quality control in education is allowing teachers to get away without being inspected. It does not make sense to me. It does not make sense politically because when you look at the numbers, the average uh, ratio of teachers to pupils, take a number, let's say 1 to 20 on average, I don't know, I think it might even be worse. So it means if I were a politician and I was worried about the number of votes, the number of kids and parents completely outweighs the number of teachers. So I would take the teachers head on and make sure that they can be inspected, they can be trained properly, and they'll deliver the education to the kids. What that about, you said it's not about money, but what yeah. about paying them properly? No, but, but you see, if you're not careful, you end up wasting resources and you're paying people who are not capable of doing the job anyway. If they are good at what they do, why are they afraid of being inspected? 
All right, so the inspection, let's come back to, to that at a later point. I still want to go on to, to the quality of, of teachers within the system. And having just come back from Nigeria and hosted a presidential task team on education with the, the Nigerian government and the Minister of Education in that space, there is certainly, uh, people don't aspire to be teachers, and this is in the Nigerian economic context. In fact, the, the quotes that were thrown out is that people who can't, teach. People who can't Advisor. teach, they have no other option. So are we seeing the same trend coming into the Southern African system? I think it's, an, it's, it's a global challenge. I mean, we work in Africa from Nigeria down to South Africa and the teaching profession itself, it's a big problem. We're not attracting the best teachers. Teaching profession is low on the scale, not high on the scale. But is that because we don't pay them enough, James? Uh, yeah, but well, I think it's throwing money to the solution to the problem is not the solution. There are a couple of things I think one needs to get, get across. One is policy. I think we've got to get a proper, a full policy shift against what we are teaching today and what we actually should be delivering for now and for the future. That's number one. Number two, whether you put in a lot of money, I think they, there needs to be a link between demand and supply. What is the market, the private sector? What, you know, what, what kind of graduates are, are they asking for? Is the education system delivering? The answer is no. Well, you bring in a, a valuable point, and I, I see John leaning over to get into this debate yeah. now. I, I'm scared he's going to climb over the desk if I don't give him the floor. There's a really important point here about, about money. And, yeah, and, and we can argue about paying people more and more. The fact is most people, most research shows, most people are unhappy if they don't get enough money to solve, solve needs, but there's not a linear increase in their job satisfaction the more money they get. You have to pay people enough money to get the issue of money more or less off the table. From there on, it's about meaning. Is that happening, though? No, and that's no. the Look, question no, that I'm asking. No, it's not, but it's not, it's not the core of the argument. It's important to pay people enough money, but the core of the argument is what provides value and purpose in your teaching. You've got to create meaning. I mean, in Singapore, there was a very clear national interest. You build up Singapore's competitiveness alone because of were no assets and you did it through teaching and education. What did you do? Paid people enough, but then you did performance management, the sort of thing you learn Precise. in business school, by Precise. the way. And that's to <laughs> your point. You see, we were business coming back to the performance so, management. Yeah. So manage that process. So it's much more complex than that. So don't trivialize it by saying it's just money, but of course pay people enough because money is important. And I, and I want to clarify yeah. that point. I'm not trivializing it. I'm not saying that it is all about that. money, but I am mm. saying pay people enough and mm. then allow the passion to come through because it's difficult to have that passion if you can't make ends meet. I think that's what I wanted to put on, on the table in this discussion. And when you're managing the issue of money, you don't just think there's the money and now the rest takes care of itself. Pay the money, but now you've got the big challenge. How do you construct an education system that inspires people, gives them dignity, makes mm -hmm. people want to get involved in it? And the yeah. children look up to the teachers, so they want to become teachers too. That's what we need. Well, let's, let's start constructing that education worry. system on the I worry about days. this money issue. You see, let's start, you have to start by making sure you're paying the right people. So you have to we have to address the issue of how get the right how do we get the right teachers into the system? Mm -hmm. Because okay, if, so you let's unpack if you it put there. the money, how do we get France. the right? Let, let's take it yeah. one by one. Yeah. Because yeah. again, I don't like these forums to be talk shops. Mm -hmm. I like us to come to the end of our discussion and to say, you know, we've we've hit on one, two, three, four, five yeah. points, yeah. and here's a workable solution. Now we're going to take that to the Minister of Education, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. he can do with it what he wants, and hopefully he'll find that we have thought through everything. Yeah. So how do we find the right people? For I think the, the first stage is train them. Make sure that I mean they, there's very, I mean, well, well accepted standards uh, of how to train teachers, right? I'll, I'll Curriculum understood. I would say before even training yeah. is the selection and identifying the best. If you look at the example of Teach America or Teach UK, they identify the best graduates of math, science, English. In this case, in most African uh, uh, states and contexts, the people who go into, teacher, into teaching are the grade C students. Why are we not getting grade A students to go into teaching? Uh, Commit for two I years. I think you have to be careful. Yeah. No. So let's look at other, tra other uh, occupations. In, in tennis, in golf, and things like this, it's not the top players who end up being the teachers. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, there. so you have to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be C players <laughs> to become the best coaches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, I think <laughs> but so but are we I saying that we cannot get grade A no, teachers? No, 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 no. What I'm saying, though, Let's make sure we, we're equip going with the coaching them. element. <laughs> yeah. 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 Let's equip them properly. We can't, we, that one we cannot debate. That we need to equip them properly. So but it's training. training. Train them properly. But a critical stage is performance management. So once you've trained them, you need to continue making sure that those people continue to deliver the goods. 
Yeah. Where are these training institutions? Do they exist in the Southern Africa sphere? Look, right. the most unpopular answer to all this about where the teachers come from is you, you have to manage some fundamental drivers. Unless you understand what education is for and why it benefits the national interest. And by the way, there's not a clear piece of research that if you educate people brilliantly, the nations do well. Because, you know, the American education system isn't one of the best in the world. It's extremely competitive. There's a lot of things about educating creativity, initiative, business acumen that are not academic subjects. So you actually got to create a sense of purpose. Why does this matter to people? And then government ministers and companies need to sit behind that. We need to be clear and articulate about why we do that. That's the first point because that creates a purpose. From there on we need to start selecting people and training them and I agree you've got to train rigorously, you've got to recruit pretty well mm -hmm. but not good academics are not always good teachers, yeah. you know that. I, I still, <laughs> want, I still want visibility. They're brilliant in their own way. You know. <laughs> I still want visibility on the training institutions for teachers in the southern African space. Do so you, you have an answer for me? Universities should play a critical role in this. You know they're, 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 they're a resource of knowledge and should be a center of training for most of the M most of the s school and academic environments. Uh, the one challenge I think that South Africa and many other countries face mm -hmm. is in the, in the last decade, a lot of teacher training colleges were closed. And, uh, this is where I was coming. And, and, that, and, that, and that's a real challenge that we face, again, alongside that vocational colleges. And uh, without a pool, w without resources to be able to retrain people, you then face a challenge of how you then overcome. Because then we come back to money. Mm -hmm. We need money to put up these training institutions, get them back up and running. You don't believe so? You see, again, the, I mean, okay, let me give it, I'm a Zimbabwean, yeah? And I think globally, in spite of what the politics say, Zimbabwe has continued to confound people mm -hmm. in terms of its education systems. Partly it's because there were education training colleges for teachers, mm -hmm. yeah? For different levels, you do your academic uh, work, and then in order to become a teacher, you have to go and spend two, three years training to be a teacher. The education system I went through, until I went to A level, I did not see equipment in a laboratory. Mm. By the way, I've got a PhD in physics, okay? So I want to debunk the money, money issue. Not only money for pay, but money for equipment. I'm not resources. saying it's not important. Do we not need resources? We then? do need resources, but let's just not get too carried away. I think part of the challenge, especially in this country, I'm sorry if I'm to go sensitive here. I'm worried about what you're going to say now. You know, let, let me tell you what, I, if I contrast my experience in Zimbabwe, another challenge that I think this country has is just how much do parents care? How, what do parents tell their kids about education as the tool to equip them for life? This for us was like, you want to change your life? This is what you have to so do. So it comes back to the home yeah. environment. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Still, we are sitting with the dearth of training institutions for teachers in Southern Africa. Is that a fact? Is it a fact? Well, let me put you out of your misery, if I may. Please. Because you're I, I'm trying, trying to say I'm trying to <laughs> move on to the next point, and I'm not going on until I get an answer Of course we need here. more training institutions. Thank you very much. Yes, All right. Do. So that's okay. number one. And, yeah. and we need resources. Yeah. Secondly, what is the, the next thing that we need to, to mandate ourselves with? The next challenge that you're facing. So let's, let's go to the home. Well, Maybe I, yeah. introducing that culture that education is crucial to a child's development and that teachers, I mean parents, need to mm -hmm. instill that in their children. But, but you see, I think that, that puts you in a pretty difficult situation. If when kids look out into the community at large and they see lots of people who appear to be successful according to their measure of success, who, don't have, who have not gone to school, then they start asking the question, why do I have to mm -hmm. go to school? Wepel, I need you to come in here. <laughs> give, a, give us a female perspective. <laughs> well, well, I think, I think uh, Nkosana raises a, a good point because you, that's what young people do. Say, I hear you, and I, and I talk to all these things with young women, and they say, I hear you, you've gone to school, you've got three degrees, but I know so-and-so who's making 200 million a year, and she only has a metric. Yeah. So, you know, it's it, but but I think that discussion needs to move a bit further and say yes, they do. But from where you are and to improve your life, this is the the most definite route or the most safe route that you can to just open up your mind. You can decide when you go into tertiary or so forth to whether there are other routes that you want to follow. But definitely, not everybody is lucky enough to get the two hundred million rand contract and so forth. Can, uh, I contract, yeah. can, <laughs> can I bring us back now to public versus private? Yeah. Right. Public versus private education. 
is there wide disparity in Southern Africa? Well, yes, yes of so, course yeah, there is. Yeah. We all know there is. And, and there are many public schools that are trying bravely and uh, to redress that. And many people in the public sector who would like to do that. So I've heard some very yeah. angry public sector school teachers on radio saying, but yeah. why are you saying that the quality of our education yeah. is any in, is inferior to that of no, a private no, no, school? These people are trying really hard, you know. And one of the things that happens in a private school that's had its own relatively consistent education environment for 20, 30, 50 years, they create Amelia, an environment where people learn that they attract good people who want to teach and there's a spirit that, that emerges within that institution which is a guided thing for learning. And all schools are trying to do that and we need to help them. If you want to do a high, high leverage intervention in the school system, work with the principals, educate the principals, help them, teach them how to do it, give them resources and then educate the teachers. I like that as a solution. Yeah. Work with yeah. the principals, engage with yeah. the principals. Mm. Can we close and, and, that and gap between public and private? Inspect your teachers private? regularly. That's inspect that's your teachers that's regularly that's at the performance, performance management. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can we close that gap between the public and private sector? I, I think through lessons of, um, of models that have been applied in other parts of the world, we, we need to think about how we actually manage the public education system. Uh, and you know the models in the US and other parts of the world contract schooling where you actually bring in a private provider to up the game of a public sector system uh, but tie them to results and performance which uh, comes back to what and Kulsana is saying, performance which, management. Yeah. Correct. So, w which you know, you only pay them based on performance, and I, and I think that's where South Africa might need to get to, because history has shown that over the last twenty years the system has been failing. Mm -hmm. Last week there was a conference on SA basic education uh, up uh, up at Empress Palace, and that was one of the big issues. And you know, from the discussions, it was clear that there's an o observation that things have been going down and the question is where do we stop it and how do we then uh, uh, go back on the rise can i just bring another issue here if you look at the current the current uh, global economic crisis and you look at european economies and you look at the resilience of the german economy i think we could learn a lot about what underpins i think one of the factors that underpin the german uh, the resilience of the german economy is their education system because also in, in Africa, we've tended to define education too narrowly. We touched on it, but mm -hmm. on, only glancingly. We've defined education as if it's academic and producing academicians and professors and what have you. But a broader approach to education, I think, is necessary. In other words, to, to understand that there are some people who want to be prof professors by all means. But there is a lot of other people with other attributes and interests and skill sets which may not necessarily fit into the mold of becoming an university professor. And what most African countries did was when we got freedom or independence, we confused uh, access to opportunities with access to the academic stream and closed teacher training colleges, uh, technical colleges, and so on and so on. But when you look at a country like Germany, and you, in fact, I, th I gather there is about three streams. In other words, there is the very academic, and uh, then there is people who go into uh, trades, but in between they leave the option of moving either way. So these can cross over through some in uh, intermediate stage. The dual system. Yeah. So, and I think we need to go back to the how we structure our education system. Again, for what purpose, as James says, because there is a range. Any economy is not made out of just professors. And it goes back to the Kickstart program. Perhaps you can just, before we go to the break, give us a, a little more insight into how Kickstart is helping not only in South Africa, because I know SAB Miller is deploying the same initiative in other countries. Yes. So essentially, the, the, what we do, we run it as a competition model. And so all entrepreneurs <coughs> excuse me, would, would apply. And what we do there is we focus, the training focuses on business management, finance, entrepreneurship, operational management, all the practical things that they'll need to know. And what we've done is we were very conscious to ensure that it's not seen as a mini MBA because it's not. It's something practical that works for entrepreneurs on the ground. So we spend a lot of time. Also softer uh, 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 skills around understanding yourself and the environment that you play in and how you manage people that you work around, all of that stuff is what we put into the curriculum. And we've seen lots of good results, even those who don't make it through post the competition, but the knowledge 
of having been in the training has been phenomenal. And then we then move on to mentorship and business development and so forth. I so see a lot of agreement yeah. around the table. <laughs> this yeah. is exactly what we need. The, the, one, the one point I think it's worth putting out is that we don't often talk about it, but one of the key things around education <coughs> is the provision of confidence and optimism. You can't be a cynical educator, and there's no good being a pessimistic one. So things like the, the Kickstarter there produce confidence and optimism through experiential learning and trial and error. So people come out ready to try things. And you know what? That's one of the main outputs of education. Well, we're going to a short commercial break, yeah. and we'll be back with more insights from our panelists straight after this. Stay tuned to CNBC Africa. <laughs> Welcome back to the CNBC Africa World Economic Forum special broadcast focusing on the role of education in empowering the Southern African region. John, do we have the right leadership in Southern Africa to change education? You know that leadership question, everyone expects you to answer with, it, with personalities, it's not about that. Leadership is, a, is, is, leadership is a quality, isn't it? And so, yes we do in places, but generally the ethos around education I don't think is right yet. Firstly, if education is about a meritocracy, it's about good people doing better, then that's got to reflect in every part of our public life. In politics, we need political leaders, we need the best leaders to go into politics. You know, we need that to reflect everywhere. And so then we need to start education institutions that give people a chance to make mistakes because you're only going to get confidence and build confidence by trying something out that's difficult, failing at it, having another go, and generally having the confidence because you succeeded. We don't want education systems that, that stigmatize failure and, and that make it a, a problem if you try something out in a new way and don't get it right. You want to, to develop inquiring minds. People will take on an economy and try and push it forward. And that's the ethos we want. We have to believe in ourselves and the people with whom we're, uh, the people that we're educating. So be brave enough to innovate. Doesn't that bring Absolutely. us to centers of excellence, James? What can we learn from centers of excellence? Yeah, I, I think Africa's problems should be solved by Africa itself. And there are many things happening in the continent. You know, if you look at parts of East Africa, or West Africa, you know, running very low cost private schools that have taken over the failing public education system, you know, there's something that South and other parts of Africa should be learning about. That's the first. The second thing is uh, the issue about entrepreneurship. You know, are we using entrepreneurship and learning from other parts of the world and even Africa, Kenya, Nigeria to educate our students to be job creators and not job seekers? You know, th there are many foundations, both East and West, that are already doing some of the things like Kickstart does. Kickstart is a great model. They, they rolled out in Nigeria, in Uganda, sorry, in Botswana and other countries. And, you know, how can we then emulate those lessons to, you know, roll up and pass that over to other parts of the continent. I think the last one is the area of when you, when, you, when you get into entrepreneurship, failure is a constant. And are we celebrating failure? Here in Africa, if you fail, you're actually condemned for good. Mm. You know, I, I want to go back to the issue of leadership. Mm. And I had a feeling you were going to bring me back to the <laughs> issue of leadership. You see, because if we're not careful, we're going to talk about activity that is undirected. Mm. Because if you don't know where you want to go, any road will take you there. Yeah? So what, what am I getting at? If, if you've got and the leadership in this sense, I'm not even talking about education. It's more just the clarity that if I want to drive from here to Cape Town, I need to define that that's where I want to end up. Because by taking Cape Town as a destination, I'll be able to work out how long it's going to take me to get there, what resources I've got and need, and I will be able to articulate in a very co cogent way to whoever I might need as a support system. Well, this is the journey I'm on to. These are the resources I need. This is how long it's going to take me. Now, if we begin to look at leadership that way, all of the things we're talking about are, are activities to, to get to what exactly? So I think we need to get our leaders to begin to define what is the journey? What is the end objective? The vision. Where, where Talking about this vision. Again, you see, I, I'm trying you to avoid it. You don't like the word vision. I'm trying to avoid it because I'm it's been made very cheap. I'm worried to use any cheap. words here. These <laughs> words have been made <laughs> to, be, to mean almost like nothing. So I want so to So how, how are you going to define that endpoint? So where, what is my destination? In five years from now, ten years from now, what are the measures I choose that by that time I will have achieved these things? Mm. Then I, keep, I can begin to say, here is where I am today. This is where I want to get in this time, period, time frame. 
And these are the things I will need to do in order to get there. I can articulate that story, that journey, so to speak, and mobilize people to come with Are me. Are you saying then we don't have the right leaders to get us to the end destination? Is that me, what you're saying? Show me a country that is defined that journey in a manner that you understand. That its own people understand in order to come along so with So we you. don't have the right leadership? Well, <laughs> Wait, Bella, do you want to help, help in Kosana out here? I actually <laughs> wanted to say national <laughs> development plan. It's so, how many yeah. South Africans, do you understand it? <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> you, you, perhaps, perhaps. But, but perhaps, le, 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 let me come in here and say, mm. for us, from a private sector point of view, it's the biggest thing for us is how do we then ensure that we get people who are ready to be in the workplace? What is it that needs to be done in tertiary institutions or in the educational system as we've come to, to discuss? I, I beg to yeah. differ. Let me tell you what. So again, let's use this country. If people understood where they wanted to take their country, it's not about education only. If, if I'm protesting, for instance, against lack of service delivery, I don't go burning property. The, every time I destroy property, and it's nothing to do with education, I'm setting my nation back. So it's, it's, but it's we, we also bigger, looking. We yeah. also look, remember we can't solve yeah. all the world's problems <laughs> in an hour debate. Yeah. And I'm with Boipela on this one. Yeah. I want short-term solutions. What can we do to to change the status quo? I'm going back to that uh, that key phrase. Let's hear a little more from you yeah. in terms and of so, private sector so involvement. What I'm saying is we need to find manners in which we we do solve that the people that go into private sector are ready for for work or are work ready if we are absorbing people, that's the one side. And those that we're not absorbing, how do we support them to get into entrepreneurship that they're not, as, as John said, they're not job seekers and are job creators. Isn't that, that an that that destination? Isn't that a so let me tell And, and for, for, uh, lastly, yeah. lastly, I believe the National Development Plan perhaps has not been communicated properly, mm -hmm. but it's got a destination. It says where we want to be in 2030, mm -hmm. wha how, how many jobs we want to create and so forth. And the, the whole thing is about now executionalizing the plan and saying, how do we get there? How do we mm -hmm. get, then get education? Because right? we've, we've, all of this has been outlined in the plan that we've got issues in here and how do we create yeah. jobs and so forth. But let me tell you where the, the, the risks lie. You see, we're discussing education. It is a valid conversation. Let's be clear that this is only a, a, a segment, a, a, sure. a, a facet. A fraction. We are where we are. And when you articulate a, dis a destination of where you want your country to go, you need to do it in such a way that where you are today, everybody, everybody sees a role that they can play to take the country to that place. If you define right. it in such a way that you appear to be leaving out certain segments for whatever reason, then I think you dis you, you, you're not creating the cohesion you need. To John, to John, come in here. So yeah. two points. One, semi-philosophical about politics. You know, politics is about people. It has to be. And politics has to be about quality of life. Once it's sectarian, you've lost that. It's confrontational. Yeah. So what's yeah. the point? Yeah. So you've got to create a national vision that's about increasing quality of life, not necessarily about a desperate increase of wealth all the time. But what, what matters to us? How do you create education that does that? Second thing is that life is not academic. It's an impure science of trial and error. So create assessment regimes that have application. Change your syllabi so the assessments try things out. There's a messy process of, of, of application. There's a, there's a review of that and a consolidation, a reflection on that. So you have a continual process of active learning that goes forward. And this will develop not only intellectual knowledge, but applied skills and will give people a capability of judging their own actions and, and checking when their errors go wrong. If you've got a pilot, you don't want him to notice or her to notice the errors at the last moment. You want them to notice them before anyone else has noticed. Make early corrections. Same with education. Don't let this thing cascade forward. Have very good scrutiny. Very so it comes back to the performance and management. the final thing is, under no circumstances should we tolerate corruption because corruption is theft of meritocracy, theft of the people who put themselves in the firing line. They've learned theft of, from people who are the poorest. So, you know, there's no way that forms of corruption are useful in society. We might have to accept some level, who knows? But you cannot just sit there and allow it. You've got to fight this because it's stealing from our futures. James? Um, I, I think, you know, the area of uh, Again, teachers, 
I think I would always want to go back to the quality of teachers. If we don't institutionalize this from the beginning and from the very basic level, we'll never get it right at the higher levels. So that has to be the starting point. It has to be the starting point. We will now be taking questions from our audience and welcome your, your thoughts and opinions on the education discussion. Thank you. My name is Jane VG. My question is multifold and I'd like to put it to the panel broadly. Firstly, do you agree that there's a, a high rate of failure at universities which results in graduates struggling to find job placements? Second of all, do you think that this could be stemmed by learners of being told that varsity is not the be-all and the end-all and therefore going to tertiary, other forms of tertiary education. And then can the private sector become a little bit more involved at those, the, the higher levels of school uh, in, in terms of guidance and career, um, career education? So um, to, in helping teachers educate learners on, on the different career options that they have available in order to make better choices once they leave school. John, can I, can I throw this to you? And I know Corsano would sure. like to also give his thoughts. Yeah, look, look, absolutely. There are, oh, it's a great question, thank you. I mean, there are, there are too many failures. <coughs> And can we be doing more about it by, by guiding people to different forms of education? Yes, if we had them. And we must create them. So, you know, Xana raised the German model. You can also look at the Finnish model and many others, which have varied forms of education. We must slowly create those. But it's no good having a dream in our heads that this is going to happen tomorrow. We've got to build them. So in we've got to be innovative, as we, you said. We've got to do it. I mean, nobody's, there's no magic bullet here. There's no, nobody even looking to government. So your third question, which is about what could business do, is a really important one. Education is all our futures. You know, it's no good delegating your future to government or some government department or to business. We've all got to pitch in. I'm afraid we're committed. We've all got children growing up. We want to make a future for them in this continent. Therefore, we better get involved because it's a big challenge. So of course, we can do more and we must. So the one thing we need to do is demonstrate that by engagement, not just in small programs, but programs that challenge the very root of what we're thinking about these things. So let's provoke. And let's not be scared of that. And let's support, as SAB is doing. And Kosana? Absolutely. I would agree with John. That's a great question. But I would suggest to you that by the time you get to university, it's too late already in terms of career guidance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's point number one. Point number two, it's no good telling uh, learners or students that university is not the all and end all if there is no other options. Yeah. So in other words, create other real options which are also valued. Now, when you look at it, People go to university to teach. Yeah? They don't build roads. They don't build factories. They don't make machines. It, who, who does that? People have gone to a different kind of education. So the structure of the economy actually tells you the different types of provisions that you should make in your education structure. But let's go back to the foundations. By the time we get to university, it's a bit late. Let's fix the foundations. Yeah. Another question? Hi, my name is Ted Corker. Um, I think we're in a completely different dispensation. And there is, without a doubt, you need that foundational cognitive uh, process that gets you to you know, relate with people and learn the basics. Um, and at the risk of sounding too theological, the word educate is taken from a word called educo, which means to draw out from within. If you look at Trevor Manuel, I believe he had no formal education. And you look at Praveen, I believe he's a pharmacist. I say that maybe it's because they're baby boomers, but I think it was because they have the ability to learn what's required to achieve the purpose and be successful in that particular field. And I think this is the line that we should take because the definition of intellectualism is no longer what it used to be eons ago. Uh, someone's ability to memorize something in high school doesn't guarantee them a spot in the later uh, life, as it were. So wouldn't it be smarter or wiser to teach people at the age of accountability the ability to learn what they require to be successful in life? Yeah. Thank you. Well, I've got to yes, yeah, 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 all right. That's <laughs> absolutely. Such a powerful I, we, question. I think we all want to answer. Yeah. But that's absolutely right. You know, we teach stuff. We teach skills or we teach cognitive stuff. But what we need to teach is a capacity to learn. If yeah. you teach somebody to learn well, then nothing you know you can learn through any change. Yeah. And then, then you can, you're confident in your future. You don't shy away from opportunities, nor do you take the shortcuts. It builds a confidence. So I'm completely with you. You're obviously an educator. 
Well, I, I, was, I was going to say the capacity to learn, but also I think mm. what's been powerful, if I look at my own uh, career through school and, and so forth, is, is having somebody actually sit and show you what you are good at or areas that you could follow. Mm. Because, and that happens earlier on. By the time you get to metric or grade 12, it's already too late. Somebody needs to say, these are the areas that you could explore and go further and look into those areas. And I said, oh, this actually speaks more about me. This is how I like learning and actually improving or, or, or enhancing that environment for me it, it has been the most positive way to ensure that you get the best out of people. Mm. You've got to teach them in how they best learn. Yeah. Oh, I, mean, I couldn't agree with you more. As I said earlier on, for me, education is a discipline of the mind or acquisition of tools that you can use to solve whatever problems are thrown at you. That is education for me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to say, the, if you look again, I, I like global perspectives and you know, understanding from other parts of the world. An education system like the Montessori system, what it does, it explores you as a person to understand where your strengths lie. And what you then do with that is build on what your strengths are. And those are the kind of systems I think to date we should be trying to incorporate at a very young stage to identify what the learners edge is or capability is and direct them towards those different channels. Yeah. Well, do we have another question? Thank you. Um, <coughs> hi, I'm Pilani Nyalunga. Uh, this question is uh, directed to Ngosana, uh, pardon me. And he mentioned uh, before the break that um, uh, the regulatory environment is also one of the challenges in, in this space. What then, what steps can be um, taken to reform uh, the regulatory system? Well, I, uh, let me be very precise. I, I refer to the issue of the trade, the way I understand what's going on here, is that trade unions are almost like setting the rules. They, they're setting themselves to be their own police in performing the job that should be inspected by a third party. And that, in terms of, I don't understand whatever logic you use, it does not make sense to me. Because if I look at it politically, which you must always consider, so if I'm in, I want it to be elected and I look at the number of teachers and I care about those numbers, then I look at the number of parents and students. And I'm saying to you, the number of parents and students far outweighs the number of teachers. So why are the teachers being allowed to get away with what they're doing? Why are the trade unions in this respect being allowed to get away with what they're doing? They are literally killing this nation in terms of how they are constraining the ability to supervise their performance. And I think it's wrong. Do we have a final question from the audience? Thank you. If I could just move the mic. Hi, my name is Dakin Kumeleni. Uh, my question really goes to uh, Wipilo because she has talked quite a lot about enterprise development. As part of the transformation journey in this country, private sector is required to contribute towards enterprise development. How are we making sure that as private sector, we're not just um, throwing money into the problem, but there's actually a lot of substance that is sustainable for the future economy um, in the country? Number two, um, how are we also making sure that in terms of enterprise development, it's all very inclusive, not just for the people who are in, in the urban areas, but for the people who are in the outskirts of, the, of this country. Thanks. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll look at this from an SAB point of view, and your last question around footprint is SAB is obviously everywhere around this country. And when we do for Kickstart or our recruitment, we look everywhere around the country, and we try and ensure that we reach each corner of the, of, of, of the country. But for us, we've actually come up with a model and say to run a successful enterprise development, you need to ensure that you select the right people. It's very important. Make sure that it's out there. But that you also have good training for them, that they understand what it is that they're doing. That's short term, though. What you also need is mentorship and business development. And in there, you talk to individual companies and individual SMEs where you say to them, what is your journey? Where are you going? How do we support you? How do we get you to the next level? What are your three-year commitments and strategies that you need to put together and so forth? And the last part speaks to, it's also access to finance, ensuring that you give them finance because all of this just becomes talk. Lastly, access to markets. And I would argue that access to markets is probably 
the most important one if you're helping SMEs. How do we open up markets for them, such as, as we do at SAB within the supply chain and so forth? So those are the main things that you really need to look at if you want to run a successful enterprise development. Um, Hi, thank you so much for the interactivity that we've seen from our audience this afternoon. Now, I said at the outset that we were going to put together uh, a mini document that we're going to submit to the Minister of Education, and it can be passed around all the Ministers of Education in Southern Africa, so I am going to be true to my word. Now, to borrow from the McKinsey website, there is an article there about lifting Africa up by empowering its youth, and I just want to throw this out there. What does the average unemployed youth look like in Africa? She's an 18-year-old girl living in a rural area, literate, but not attending school. Now, we're going to change that status quo with the document that we are going to submit. It's going to have only four points. You're each going to select a point, and we're going to build that as we go. John, you're going to have the easy task because we're going to start with you. <laughs> we're now going to say <coughs> that girl is four years old. She is hungry. She is eager, she wants to learn. She wants the passion that you've been talking about on this desk about education. So how do we make sure that she doesn't turn into this 18-year-old unemployed youth living in a rural area that is not attending school? So what is the first thing we need to do for her? Well, I'm gonna give you three. The first thing is give her food because people who don't have food can't get to school. And we often, we support campaigns where people need to feed food and transport and then create a teacher training system that is disciplined, discipline is from a Latin root meaning learning, disciplined, well paid, but where they're incentivized and performance managed in a much richer way based on the quality of the learning and the, the enthusiasm they generate. You know, enthusiasm is much more important at the age of four than anything else, so get them going and enjoying it. Fantastic. James? Um, give her access to a school infrastructure that you know that, that, uh, that so she's gives got the food she's got the transport she's got the enthusiasm in the environment and now you're giving her the Infra school yeah the infrastructure and then to give her the tools and that's the curriculum that is relevant so the right learning environment from an infrastructure perspective and then, and then the curriculum correct and then the third one I think is br bring to her people who would be role models to make her realize that education at the end of it will lead her to something Gosana, the task is getting harder as yeah, we progress. It is, it is but um, uh, uh, fortunately they left out given the teachers are properly trained. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. And that goes right to number one. Yeah, t teachers were properly trained, but again we go back to the definition of education. What does it mean properly trained? They should understand that education is about teaching problem-solving skills. Yeah. Problem-solving skills in your environment. Bopelo? I definitely think after everything they've said, it just leaves giving her opportunities and exposing her to possibilities out there. And that also happens within the school education. So if she knows there's more that she can achieve, then she goes for it. If she doesn't, then she, she obviously won't aspire to be better. Thank you so much for your input and uh, sharing your valuable thoughts. That brings us to the end of the third and final installment of the CNBC Africa World Economic Forum Road to Abuja Regional Discussion Series. As I said, thank you to my guests, John Foster Pedley, Henley Business School, uh, Africa, James Wanshohi, Wan he's the James Education Solutions, in Kosana Moyo, Mandela Institute for Development Studies, and Boy Pelo in Kadimeng, SAB Miller. And of course, thank you to our audience. Until next time, it's goodbye.